So we're back in our series uh, of Real Talk as we're going through the schematic traps, schemas of how we view ourselves, others, and the world. And I think it's been a very powerful series. And I said this, I think um, it can become really exhausting to dig deep within yourself. Because it, the question we're asking um, in, in the series is, what the heck is wrong with me? Right? To ask someone, what is wrong with you? Tell them everything. In one hand, everything. In the other hand, nothing. And couples don't sit together. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, I mean, what is wrong with me? I have so many problems, so many issues. This is so annoying. I mean, if you're not annoyed with yourself, you don't know yourself too well. The guy in your head and the gal in your head, they always are blabbling about things. And, and interrupting you in mid-relationship, mid-thought a lot of times. And, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about um, what is wrong with me? Nothing and everything. So there's a tension um, in our lives called personal growth, right? I mean, this is why we're meant to learn. And sometimes we're going to stumble on the way. A, a baby can't just walk without crawling first. There, there's a psychological, evolutionary, developmental process to everything in life. And so tell someone next to you, you're OK. You're just fine. You're a hot mess. Yeah, but the Bible says you're, you are a masterpiece. Kego, you are a masterpiece. Did you learn that at Tish, to be a masterpiece? Or paint a masterpiece. The Bible says you're a masterpiece, but you know, just like every Pixar film, which they say the first script and the first time they animate it is the worst movie ever created. And then they, they edit it and rewrite the script so it can make sense 18 to 90 times. And just like that, um, God is working in our lives, molding us. Like, you know. And sometimes it's going to feel frustrating, but I just want to say, relax. Okay, enjoy the journey. Trust him. Amen? Okay. So let's go to the schema this week. Let's put it up there. And I want to make it simple as possible. It's subjugation schema. And this is going to be the life trap. Let's put up the point. So the subjugation schema, SS, is a chronic and excessive accommodation of others. Read it with me. Motivated by what? Retaliation or guilt condemnation. So this subjugation schema is an excessive accommodation of others. And it's chronic. You struggle with it every day because of fear or guilt. And you know, here's the thing. In relationships, what motivates us to do things? There's always an incentive. There's something motivating us to do why we do what we do. And so this particular one, I think, is very critical for all of us in this room, especially if you're more passive. And you know, you're, you're, you're the guy or the gal when someone asks you, hey, what do you want to go eat? I don't care. And you really do, but you, you say you don't care. You never assert yourself. Um, you're just like, whatever, man. I'm just like, I'm a hippie. I'm just good with whatever. I'm cool. I, you know, it doesn't matter to me. And you go, you know, so how are you doing? Whatever, doesn't matter. I'm good. It, there's a, there's a, a, a developmental process, I said, of developing yourself. This schema particularly leaves you undefined in ambiguity. And it's actually the most annoying thing to deal with in relationship, because passive aggressive tendencies come out later. And we'll talk about the Incredible Hulk later. But you know, if the subjugation schema is huge in, in, in being, becoming a person that's a pushover. And here's the problem with being a pushover, implicitly, even explicitly. Because you see, in life, in the end of the day, you know, I know this is a bad analogy, but it, in life, life is a game. And the truth is, there, there are social rules to the game, and we all have to play it, right? But you can clearly tell when you play like a board game. How many people love board games, right? 
those, there are only three people in that game playing to win. Everybody else are just accessories. They're just like talking about the color of the house in Monopoly. They're talking about, hey, I wish I could get this role. And they're talking about like magazines they read. There are three people in the room. They do not care. They just want to win. So put this picture up here, right? Okay, so it's up there already. So it's a game, and, and, and here it is. Um, I remember playing Monopoly, and oh my goodness, there are people in this. I mean, you guys playing Mafia, right? I mean, you see the characters in Mafia. You see how they're, they might be sociopaths even. It's possible. We should ask Helen to diagnose them. She probably has notes on everybody anyway. <laughs> but okay, that's scary. But... But the thing is, here it is, when, when you, I played Monopoly, and I remember, you know, th this one moment really defines the schema and how it plays into our relationships and how it defines everything. And I remember uh, two people were in negotiations, and uh, they're talking about, you know, sometimes you want the blues or the greens and other kind of properties, so they're negotiating. And so... This one brother asked the other brother, so, so what do you want for the greens? I want nothing, bro. And he's like, no, I'm just trying to make a deal with you. Like, he's coming off passively, you know, really nice, you know. You know, what do you want? Okay, I'll give you all my properties and all my money. He goes, nah, I'm not trading with you. He goes, and so the guy goes, well, what do you want me to do? I'm just trying to play this game. And the other brother says, just die. <laughs> it became personal. <laughs> he said, just die? Everybody's shocked. There's no euphemisms for this. and he's not. A, but the truth is, that's the point of the game of Monopoly. To kill you. To bankrupt you. Why are we playing this game to Donald Trump you? I mean, the whole point of Monopoly is to win, and to win, you must kill everyone. And so, in the subjugation schema, a lot of times, if you don't learn to what? To stand up for yourself, to voice your opinion, to state your truth, your voice, there are a lot of utilitarians that with the entitlement schema that are going to run over you. Because if you ask them, what do you want me to do? Why are you treating me this way? Just die. Do it my way. Just do it my way. And out of fear and out of guilt, a lot of times people give in to people's demands. And it's motivated, by the way. And so what ends up happening then to your life? You become a pawn. You keep dying, not to the right things, not for transcending reasons, not for beautiful reasons, not for life-giving reasons, just to give the narcissist its demand. Either because you're going to retaliate in relationship take approval away from you, you give in because of fear. You give in because of guilt. You become a doormat. You see this in relationships. and Many times therapists talk about this. If you have an abandonment schema, right? This, these, this is the worst relationship, and I'm not describing anybody, but here we go. If you have an abandonment schema, you're afraid that someone's going to leave you. And that happens in early child lessons, right? In adolescence. So you're going to do whatever the other person wants. A, a, a parental figure, paternal figure, uh, so you're a good boy, a good girl, so that what, they, they approve of you and keep you around, that you're not left behind. So if this schema is developed into what? Adolescence and adulthood and maturity, you're going to do what everybody wants you to do so they don't leave you. And in, particularly in relationships, those who struggle with the abandonment schema are always subjugated themselves. They always surrender. They do whatever to please the other partner, even if that person is abusive, demanding, and psychotic. You give in to the demands. And so these two schemas begin to collide. 
and you end up being abused, hurt. And the thing is, people who don't want to be left love. They feel so much chemistry with people who are divas. Ask someone else if you're a diva. <laughs> yes, I'm a diva. You're demanding, insistent. And, and you're going to feel chemistry, like sexual chemistry, with people that are like that because you, you know how to fulfill the needs of someone that's so explicitly expressive of their demands. So you know how not to be left behind. So you try to fulfill them. This, this sometimes works in even professional settings. You become a helper, an assistant, someone that can fulfill your boss's demands. And you do whatever, whatever extra these are the people that are always, you know, working 9 a.m., 10 p.m. because the boss asks them to do something extra because they don't know how to what? Say what? No. Because if I say no, what's going to happen to the relationship, right? What if, if, what if sometimes a friend texts you, hey, come out, and you're like, I don't want to go out. But they insist, come on, man, stop being a loser. Come out. Stop staying inside. Come. No, I don't want to go. But you can't say no because what? You're, you're afraid how that will change the relationship. You say yes, and you don't want to be out there, especially if you're an introvert. You hate going out anyway. I mean, some, I'm an introvert. I went to a lounge once. Someone invited me, and I was like, how do you even talk here? The bass was like, boom, boom, boom. I was like, what? Am I, I have a headache. How do, I mean, I don't get how people, like, do people hang out by just hang, like, does hanging out mean just, like, being there? Because there's no way you can have a conversation. But people, I mean, they do this anyway, and they give in. They keep giving in. So what's the outcome? You become a what? A shell. You become indirect, indecisive, passive-aggressive pawn that becomes complicit to other people's deep entitlement issues. And you never find out who God made you to be the masterpiece. You're not in development. You're not in process. You're not being developed because you're always fulfilling the needs of other people because you feel bad or you're afraid. You never develop yourself. Like this picture. Do you want to become this person? If we don't learn to die for the right reasons and for the right things, this would be very difficult. Subjugation works very deep. It goes into the family of origin, right? I mean, there are particularly family boundaries that are needed. There, there are some people in this room cannot say no to their parents. You can't say no. My, my kids are really good at it. They have no problem with this schema. I, I, I wish they have it sometimes. But people in this boundary is because you're so addicted and you're so afraid to lose approval, it's impossible for you to draw boundaries. And sometimes when you get married into these families of origin, you're not just marrying your partner, you're marrying like eight other people. And they're like in the bed with you. I mean, you know, I'm not to, you know, literally you're, you're, you're living with eight people because they don't have an opinion about their lives. They're, they, they've decided to what? Be complicit and surrender and die for loyalty. And, and it becomes a problem. Like there's World War III, you know, whose family are we spending Thanksgiving with, Christmas with? Oh, there's a, there's a fight right there. And, and the loyalties get drawn out. So here's the thing. This behavior ultimately comes out. You keep giving in. You keep giving in to other people's demands. You keep pleasing other people. And eventually, this is the whole schematic view of the Incredible Hulk, of why you, you know, literally want to kill other people. And sometimes why people do kill other people. 
and it comes out in toxic ways. And let me just tell you, those of you who struggle particularly with this issue, you will hurt the people that you don't want to hurt. Like if, for example, if you're mad at your boss, a lot of times in therapy, people talk about yelling at their children, taking out on their kids. Why? Because they have power over their kids. They don't have power over their boss, right? So the anger is indirected sometimes. And you start yelling at people, hurting people that you're supposed to love the most, but because you can't control the rage, the fact that you're trapped, it comes out and hurts those as closest to you. And that's not the way you want to live. So the question I have for you today is, are you living someone else's life? Are you doing the things because you want to do them? Or are you doing them because someone else wants you to do them, or you're afraid if you don't do them, you'll lose approval, or you'll feel bad? Tell someone next to you, let them feel bad. It's okay. Let, tell them, let them feel bad. <laughs> so be like, no. I feel bad. It's okay. Everybody feels bad. Learn to say no. People ask me sometimes, you know, I, you know, I remember as a professor, this was really difficult for some. People ask me, so can I get an extension? No. But, you know, my life is falling apart and I broke up with my girlfriend and my dog died. No. I said, my dog will die too one day. Here's the thing. Everybody has problems. But if I let you, right, if I let you extend on the paper, then I'm going to have to read it later. And I promise my kids I'm taking them to the movies. And I have to prepare my message or I'm going to have nothing to say. Right? And I have to, I have to greet other people. So it, the consequences kept being, keep being pushed other, other way around when the person can be totally re- irresponsible. And you know what? The person hated me for a moment, but they're just fine. Or I think they're just fine. I mean, who knows? Not my responsibility. But in the end of the day, I have to say no, right? Because what? I have responsibilities on my own. I mean, because I feel bad or they'll feel... That's... That's not really my issue. I have to be responsible for my own actions. You know, there's a movie, I mean, this is, it's going to reveal my age, but there's a movie, The Runaway Bride, with Julia Roberts. If you haven't seen it, it's a classic. This is when we used to go to Blockbuster Video and rent (laughs) movies, you know, and, um, I mean, what a scene. And The Runaway Bride is about Julie Roberts always being that object of subjugating herself to please, finding what pleases her man. And she does everything. She becomes her man, like likes the sports team, likes the, his favorite eggs, likes the way he, you know, he does laundry, clean, you know, his activities. She becomes, she accommodates and becomes the, the person she's in relationship with. She knows how to please. That's who she is. She's, her identity is a pleaser. And then at, at every wedding, she feels a chronic anxiety come over her. Because she can't articulate why she feel, feels this, these, this anxiety or, or fear, but she knows this, there's something not right about this. So she always runs every single time, multiple times. Of course, you know, in the film, someone asks her this question, and I thought it was a really powerful scene. She goes, how do you like your eggs? And then she thinks about all the people she dated, how they like their eggs. But she never, ever figured out how she likes her eggs. And so this, this picture illuminates for many of us. So, you know, what do you want? Ask someone next to you, what do you want? Never have a meeting with your professor or me if you don't know what you want, people come to me sometimes. I talk to them, so, and, and then they, they just babble on, yeah, so this happened, that person. And I go, hey, what do you want? I don't know. 
If you don't know what you want, you don't know who you are. That's why. You've been surrendering so much. You've been accommodating so much. You've been appeasing so much. You are other people. You're an ideologue, which is really an idiot. You just sound like other people because you don't know who you are. And so here, here is what, what it, subjugation does to you. It robs you of your, who you're meant to be, who God created you to be. All right, so what's the good news of the gospel then? Here, let's read this passage. I think pay close attention to what Jesus says. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. If you want to talk about subjugation, you talk about dying, you want to talk about surrendering, Jesus is the greatest model of surrendering his life for the sake of others. But, but the father didn't impose it on him, if the text says. He wasn't forced to. He wasn't subjugated to. He what? He chose to. What? For the sake of love. He says, no one takes it from me. Why? He's the second person of the Trinity. He is preeminently omnipotent, omniscient. He has all the power. But what? He says, but I laid it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So you see, Jesus as a model in, in Lent season of surrendering and dying to the right things and for the right things. Not motivated by the fear or guilt, but because you want to. You know how good it feels to sacrifice because you want to, not out of any other convulsions? Because that's, that's when you sacrifice for the sake of love. To choose to lay down your life. You know, I've been in, in so many relationships in the last two decades or so, all the way from college in many different settings. And, you know, I've learned bad habits of dying for loyalty and being seriously hurt by those, betrayed in many ways. And then I've learned that all I had to do was look at the life of Jesus. He wasn't coerced or manipulated. He chose to lay it down. And so the question I have for you is, do you even have a choice in what you're choosing to do? Or are you coerced or manipulated, motivated by fear and shame? Because when Jesus laid down his life, it was out of love. He died for you and me, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Because I know in some relationships, less light here, less, and we're going to end, is that some, I know some guys in dating relationships have to not watch the movies because you have to watch it with their significant other. There's like a carnal rule. That, you know, if you watch it, there's retribution or punitive retribution that happens. Or if you try a restaurant without the significant other, there's, there's punitive retribution that happens. I don't know how those rules came to be. They're definitely not natural rules or natural laws. I think they're part of an evil demonic scheme. So I know, I know people in relationships do not watch those movies out of fear. Raise your hand right now if you don't. I don't, know. don't. Don't. But, don't reveal, don't give it. <laughs> Jeff, put your hand down. <laughs> That's why you didn't get the AMC pass. I get it now. No, but, but here it is. It, and, and what happens end up in relationship is people keep giving up things and sacrificing things because of fear. Or if I do that, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to be yelled at or we're going to have an eight-hour conversation. And if I do that, this is going to this is going to be the retribution. It's not worth it. See, that type of relationship is not worth dying for. Why do you keep dying for that out of fear? No, 
if you want to have a, a, a blossoming relationship, a flourishing, romantic or whatever, it has to be because you want to. Not because you fear what might happen. Well, if I don't go to this event you know, with my girlfriend, she's going to dump me. Or if, then, then that's what's going to happen. That can't be the motivation. I mean, in my own relationship, with my wife, I've learned this, that I love doing things for her just because I want to, you know? Like, my wife, she's so, sacri- you know, s- sacrificial, and, you know, she does all the things around the house, helps all the boys. We're all really three little boys in the house, you know? She, she helps us succeed, and she always giving herself, sometimes she makes three different meals because we're crazy, you know? And, and even last night, she's like, you know, uh, making this, making that, you know, surrendering herself. And, and it's not no one coerced her. Well, maybe the boys have. Not me, though. <laughs> but I mean, let me tell you how I feel sometimes. And, and she ended up not eating dinner. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you not eating dinner? Oh, I'm not hungry. I mean, I've been, you know, cooking here. I don't know what I want to eat. She goes, maybe I want sushi. Nah, it's too late. So I wanted to, after we all ate dinner, I I started ordering sushi on the app. I secretly wanted some. (laughs) But I ordered a whole bunch of hashimi, a whole bunch of things, and and put it in front. I wanted to do this. I I wasn't afraid, hey, if I forget this, I'm going to yell that later. No, that feeling of, of loving someone and doing it, choosing it out of love. But then I made a mistake, ordered hajime instead of sushi. It had no rice in it, so just not enough. And, and, because, and because she's loving, she's like, come on, eat. And I'm like, I'm trying to hold myself back from eating this hajime because there's, there were only like 18 pieces. I was like, no, I don't want it. I'm full. I just ate chicken, really, and broccoli. She goes, no, you eat it. So we're fighting back. And forth. You see this loving, like, fighting back and forth. And then I go, you know what? I'm going to order more. She goes, please don't, please don't. See, you want to fight because you want to love each other. You want to what? You want to lay down your life for each other. You want to surrender to one another, not because of retribution or fear. Do you see that? Well, that took 20 years to build. But that's, that's love. That's, that's what Christ loves looks like. You want to bend your heart, whatever it is, for each other. To, the Bible actually says in Ephesians to submit to one another out of your reverence for Christ. That's why we submit, not because we fear. That's what Jesus did. He submitted out of love. And that's why the Bible says it was the joy before him he endured the cross. It it was his pleasure. Was it pleasurable to die on the cross? No, but it was his pleasure to lay down his life because of love, not because of fear. And that's the relationships the gospel invites us to, friends that submit because of love. I want to do this for you. Not because I'm obligated to. It's not my duty. I want to do this because I love you. I want to serve you. Amen? That's the vision of the gospel. That's how the gospel comes into play in Lent season. We have to model our lives after Jesus. His life, his passion, and his death. And even when he died, he didn't die for the wrong reasons. He died, what? For the right reasons. We need to learn to die for the right things. To the right things. Amen? Let's stand and pray together. Now, everybody wants to eat sushi today. Right? Now, as we lift our hands to the Lord today, I want to invite you into the kingdom of God in it, the vision of living life out of love and not duty or fear. And the tragedy of life is that a lot of us end up living a life we don't want to live because we live through the lens of obligation and duty and we feel trapped. When do we ever get to do the things that we want to do for others? We're so busy and occupied trying to fulfill the needs of others out of fear and out of guilt.
And what the gospel teaches us is that when we choose to take up our life, like Jesus did, and when we choose to lay it down for whatever reason we feel, when it's motivated through the lens of love, you're moving in the right direction. When it's out of fear and shame and guilt, you're dying for the wrong things. Only love is worth dying for, folks. That's what Jesus teaches us. So what are you dying for in your life? What are you giving into? Are you dying to the wrong things? That's burning you out? That's crushing your soul? That's trapping your life? Jesus says, come today. Let me set you free. There's a better way to live. Father, teach us to die for the right things and to the right things. Help us quit dying for the wrong things. Give me one pure and holy passion. Give me one magnificent obsession. Jesus, give me one glorious ambition for my life to know and follow hard after you. To know and follow hard after you. To grow as your disciple in the So, Father, we uh, come before you this afternoon. There are some of us in this room, God, that that live in so much guilt and so much fear. There's so so much expectation, so many different expectations and pressures put on us by those around us by paternal, by cultural, by peers, and it's suffocating the person we're meant to be. You know, the word in French, nice, means naive. Tell someone next to you right now, okay? We're going to pray and end this. Stop being nice. You're like, why? I'm really nice. Nice means naive. The Bible, look at the Bible. It never, ever, ever says be a nice person. It never says be naive. It says learn to actually be cunning as a snake and innocent as a dove. It never says be nice. Nice people cannot change the world. Nice people are actually just doormats that entitled people and narcissistic people crucify. They are the pawns in the chessboard. You are created in the image of God, the imago Dei of God, the very life of the blood of Jesus is in you and for you. Your life and who you are, what you're meant to represent and what you're meant to do is way more than being a pawn in the story of others that need serious therapy. 
Don't be nice, be courageous. Be sacrificial for the right things, for the right reasons. And if someone says, man, you've changed. You're not nice. You go, yeah, I'm not a sucker, sucker. <laughs> I want to pray today a blessing that you would become assertive, resolute, not passive aggressive, not always thinking about in your, I should have said this, I should, just say it. Not in rage, but just how you feel because you and your voice is important to God. And it should be important to other people. And that's what God is saying, I bless you today with, I free you today with. Don't be a sucker. Don't be nice. Be courageous. And let's become people who love and submit to one another for the reverence we have for Christ, not because of retaliation or shame. Amen? Will you bow your heads for the benediction? Father, today, I thank you for removing the sign of doormat from us. Jesus, you died on the cross so we wouldn't have to die. We wouldn't have to pay the penalty of the wrath of sinful men and humanity. You said it is finished to that abuse. You said it is done, competed. The work's been completed by you. You pay the wrath of every abusive entitlement in the world has to offer. You've suffered the penalty so that we might live. Today I pray that we become courageous. We become defined sense of self and become the masterpiece that you are forming us to be. I pray for protection. I bind every scheme, every resistance that the enemy has in our lives. And I pray, God, that your hand would help us flourish into the person you're making us to be so that we could become someone to reckon with in this world. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit we pray. All God's people pray. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.